It is the 19th day. <laughs> Off to a good start. It's the 19th day of December 2023. This month is running away on us. I'm going to be your host, Dana Durnford, according to the lower thirds anyway. I'm Dana, yeah, that's me. You can call in to the live show, ring ding 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 709 Don't be shy. I don't play. <coughs> here we go, rock and good roll. Where are we to here? So we another big news cycle tonight for everybody. Uh, and you know well at Chernobyl, the helicopter pilots that came in and that deposited the heavy materials to try to put down that fire, which all died from radiation exposure. Uh, what? Here's a decision question. No. So all the helicopter pilots at Chernobyl died. <coughs> So imagine if they had sent the helicopter pilots into Fukushima, because Fukushima, each of the buildings are a hundred times, we turn it up a little, another little, little notch, are a hundred times worse than uh, Chernobyl. Each of the buildings. And on top of that, at the top of the buildings, they had reactor cores and fuel pools. And there was two fuel pools at the top of each building. And... Uh, there's four of these reactors that actually melted down. This reactor one exploding and reactor three exploding. To your right is reactor three. And that's the fuel pool and reactor core if you see falling back down to the earth. They put these stumps on it, on the cover, instead of, because there's nothing left, right? They should have just took it all the way to the ground, but they decided to leave those chunks there put these covers over them. They don't physically touch the remains of the buildings because obviously there's nothing there's nothing there to support them, right? And then the media to your right, it's just a fraction of the medias, have pretended that they're actually in the building to your left at the top of it. And the top is up there. It's no longer exists, right? They tore it off. And then your world's media pretended they were in it. Now, why would you do that? And that was in 2013. This model uh, is based on 31 days, and in 31 days, the radiation covers the entire planet. Uh, it's a million to 10 million atoms per cubic meter, is what you're talking about. Get more details and on Japan's nuclear crisis. We're joined by Brendan Kennedy, professor of chemistry at the University of Sydney. Now, officially, uh, as of July the 13th of this year, 2023, uh, the United Nations is leading the charge with this cover story, claiming that, and this is a first English version of the story we've seen, as a professor at the Department of Nuclear Quantum Engineering, he said Fukushima only lost 2.2 grams of tritium. But the the buildings are complete. Get more details on Japan's nuclear fuel pools were at the top of the building. And he said a discharge is like throwing a sugar cube of three grams into the sea. But like there's not a nuclear scientist on the planet that when he's seen these reactors that didn't understand that both fuel pools at the top of each building and the reactor cores were gone. And officially, Reactor 4, they're claiming, had no losses, that they saved it. A miracle. A miracle, I'll tell you that. Uh, 14 prefectures were banned by 55 countries for a decade because it's not like potato chips or walking in sunshine or climbing an airplane. So last night we had 28 views. And 36 likes. That's pretty interesting. YouTube had 87 views, which is ludicrous to suggest that's all I had. But another interesting thing to remember was 13 hours later, as with every video, 
you can read the comments. The comments disappear for the first 13 hours. And you see I got two hours and four minutes and 36 seconds. And now I got two hours and four minutes and 40 seconds. So the video got longer. Every one of my videos after 13 hours get longer. So the pictures, these pictures are from the live stream at Fukushima last night. And the building to your left is reactor one, the remains of it. And the building to the left is reactor two. Reactor two and that's reactor one. And so the cover up is really special what they've done. They assume nobody was gonna call them on it. So this was a rare picture where they showed the four reactors in high quality. And I extrapolated some great pictures out of it that nobody else has ever shown population of the planet. And so these pictures, I was doing random screen captures last night during, after the show. I, so what they're pretending, I guess, is they're going to be getting fuel at a reactor one this time, right? Explosion at Fukushima can only have been caused by a meltdown of the reactor core. So the only thing that could cause the explosions was an actual meltdown. <clears throat> so what you done with reactor three? This is the ghost of reactor three. And now reactor three, they felt the explosion 25 miles away. Does anybody really think that there's anything left to the building to the left? That's the stump of reactor three. That should have been raised all the way to the ground. The water cannons couldn't spray it because of radiation. The helicopters couldn't spray it because of radiation. But in 2019, they came out and claimed that they're going to remove the fuel in the pool at reactor three. And this is the official picture inside of a building that no longer exists. And here's a so-called journalist pretending that they're at the top of the building looking down on the fuel pool of a building that no longer exists. So why would you go through all that trouble and that deceit and dishonesty? Uh, so the, the construction was built off site and brought in and then assembled over the reactor. It doesn't physically touch the reactor. And that's why you're seeing the framing. The framing you're seeing is the support for the structure that they put above it. But when you zoom in, you can see there's nothing left of the building. Now, if you don't know any better, that alone will tell you. But here's what the building looked like before they put the cover on it. That's one of the pictures. And here's uh, another picture to your left. So the building to your left is the remains. And they put this cover over and pretend that they're getting the fuel pool out of a building that doesn't actually exist. They've done the same thing for reactor four, uh, streaming into the atmosphere after number four fuel pool boiled dry, March the 18th, 2011. So that's seven days after the tsunami, they're acknowledging that it boiled dry. So the, the cement pump truck to the right is not meant to pump water, for starters. And so they've done the same thing with that building where there was nothing left, it was just a stump to your left. And they put this contraption over, they built it off site. And you can see when you look at it that, let's step back for a second. When you look at it, you can see that this is not what they're trying to sh claim it is. So in 2013, here they are pretending they're at the top of the building looking down on the fuel pool. That's what they're pretending they're doing right there. They're actually pretending they're above it, looking down on the fuel pool. Uh, and here's other medias at the same time. And I uh, got them listed there for you. This is just some of them that pretended. So they've done the same thing at both of the buildings. So you see what they're doing to building one to your left. They're building the same framing. And so they're most likely going to produce the same propaganda. And uh, Helen Callicott was one of them that came out and claimed that the Japanese were really tidy people and the building to your right is the real building. 
And she done this in hundreds of radio interviews. The Japanese are very tidy people, and they have, by robot control and by human beings, removed the debris from the top of Building 4, and it does look pristine. The Japanese are very tidy people, and they have, by robot Sorry about that. Well, they, they don't have, by ro robots, can't survive in that environment. Arnie used to make the assemblies, or the racks, for the assemblies for the fuel pools, and they would go in the fuel pools behind where I put them at the right. The division I ran built nuclear fuel racks for boiling water reactors exactly like Fukushima. And so if he doesn't know that it looks like the one to the right, and he's pretending it looks like the one to your left. Now, he, he built the racks for the 70 fuel pools, so he, he knows the difference, right? Bipolar robots. <laughs> Thanks, James. <laughs> so I'm very concerned when I see that picture to your left that they're going to be doing the same thing. So we believe Chernobyl's on steroids. The spent fuel pool catches fire. Each reactor holds 3,450 spent fuel assemblies. And they're trying to tell you it's like 500 or something, right? But it's significantly more. So two years uh, two years ago on the 10th anniversary, just before, I'm sorry, this that year, the 2021, the 10th anniversary year, in January, it was 736 pictures put up at TEPCO's website. And I, I, to the day, even today, I don't understand why that was posted at TEPCO's website. And so these were from drones. When I zoomed in, I started realizing everything was pixelated. And so right here is the common spent fuel pool, which has around 6,500 assemblies. But it was actually jam-packed because you don't have a repository, right? Up there is reactor 4, and over there is reactor 3. And this is from the administration building, would have been right below me, where the drone is taking a shot. So you're facing the ocean, in other words. I, bl I believe, yeah. And so now this is directly over. So reactor three is here, reactor four is there. That's the incinerator to your left of it. And up there is the common spent fuel pool. So why, oh why, oh why was the common spent fuel pool completely pixelated? You can't see any of the building whatsoever. Because that had 6,400, well, 6,375 spent fuel assemblies. Each assembly is 1,800 pounds. has 100 fuel rods. Each fuel rod is 18 pounds and uh, is 12 feet long. And so you can see with a tsunami now, the common spent fuel pool is the same height, uh, sea level wise, as reactor 1, 2, 3, and 4 are. And you can see the damage the tsunami done, right, to the tanks. This is down by reactor 5 and 6. But just before that, to the left of it was the dry storage. There's two of them. This is one of them. And we have, we actually had, TEPCO actually released, and you can go into my playlist, I, I have one set of videos of 1,900 plus pictures where there's six videos, and I go into detail about all of the pictures that they released. And we debunk the narrative of the dates that they have attached to it. And so it looks like all the dry, not all of them, but the majority of the dry cast got walked, washed away. And we, ha we have pictures of some dry cast still inside the buildings. So then it, the drone goes over, and now I have to zoom in to take these extractions, right? And you'll find, a, in my playlist, you'll find a video about these. And underneath that video is linked so you can go do download all the pictures yourself and zoom in yourself. And so why was React, because this is Reactor 5, why was Reactor 6 and the pump house and the tall stack that vents from the fuel pools, because they, they use these tall stacks to vent the fuel pools, which are splitting atoms. So it's 120,000 liters from four fuel pools in these two buildings are vented up that stack all day long. And so the question is, why did they pixelate that one? Why did they pixelate uh, the common spent fuel pool and certainly the other reactors, right? 
and reactor six and and the stack and the uh, pump house where was that pixelated because that implies obviously that they had a catastrophic event at those facilities also okay, I'm into the news cycle <laughs> nothing happens quick around here Nobody's even talks because you're not allowed to make mistakes in this subject, right? I don't have a right to make a mistake. But I also have a responsibility to make sure, even if you're brand new and never been here before, that you have a foundation so you're on the same page as everybody else. Nobody even talks about Fukushima anymore. There's almost no fish. That's 2015, December the 14th. I was actually on the ocean on a research expedition. That one was... Um, six months or something on the ocean without coming home. And every time I come into a port for fuel and uh, groceries and stuff like that, I would do all kinds of radio interviews, right? Uh, the ocean is dying. It's terrifying. You can't find the fish. We're preparing for the worst. Fukushima disaster contaminated territory of Japan, Sea of Japan, Korea. We're almost into the stories in any minute. Uh, two more, three more clicks. The Sea of Japan, Korea, up to eight orders of magnitude above global fallout background off the prefecture's coast. So obviously there's a lot went into the ocean immediately, wasn't it? And it was much worse than what they're acknowledging. So Fukushima radioactive inventory is 30 to 40 times as high as in Chernobyl. Yeah, but that's for each building. Because Chernobyl was a graphite reactor, it was a brand new reactor, and uh, it was a small inventory in the reactor core. They had no fuel pools. Each of the Fukushima reactors, there's four of them melted down, and there was two fuel pools at the top of each building. So it was four fuel pools and eight reactor cores. Eight, I'm sorry, eight fuel pools and four reactors that melted down. Each fuel pool could have up to five reactors. Rami Manuel. Uh, really, when you look at his legacy, he's not very much to be proud about, is it? U.S. TV commercial to promote Japanese scallops, which are from Hokkaido, which is the most northerly island in Japan. So why would they have a controversy about that? Well, that's the whole point, right? They don't want to talk about Fukushima because you might look up pictures and see something like this and say, wait a second, I think I'm being lied to. Doomsday-like radiation released at fire in the pool at Unit 4 would be a global catastrophe, a global catastrophe. Well, Reactor 3 fuel pools was, the, was a global catastrophe too because that was a mixed oxide facility, so-called MOX. And again, let me show you another the radioactive fallout depiction I showed you earlier. My goodness, there's... So this has followed over 30 days of a million to 10 million atoms per cubic meter of cesium-137. So this is a catastrophic event, right? <laughs> While you're there, don't forget to subscribe, like, and all that stuff. The nuclear industry will probably unsubscribe you once you, once you stop checking me out. So put me in your bookmarks so you can actually find me later. All right, let's get after Ron Israel Rami or <coughs> U.S. TV commercial promote Japanese seafood. So you had a global catastrophe because you had multiple reactors and eight fuel pools with five to six reactor cores in each one melt down. Complete gone. Completely liberated into the environment. And so like even original footage, every, every academic on the planet, every nuclear scientist, every major university, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Oxford, MIT, Every nuclear academic knew the fuel pools in the reactor cores were gone. And even today, you can't get them to tell the truth. And so Rami Manuel, which is a notorious nightmare for anybody that he's supposed to represent. Uh, so 
pre-Fukushima, it was one in a million children would have thyroid tumors. Post-Fukushima, 2012, just a year later, uh, when you scale it up, it would have been 358,000 out of a million. And the problem with that is when your thyroid, and like your thyroid uh, is three by five centimeters, the tumors are two centimeters and larger at 35.8%, which was stunning numbers, 13,646 out of 38,000, when it used to be one in a million pre-Fukushima. So he's trying to promote it and he's doing it for the TV camera. Whatever you do, please don't eat that stuff. Don't feed it to your loved ones. Unless you work for the nuclear industry, then by all means, go ahead and feed it to them. 1,500 atoms of radioactive sulfur per cubic meter of air detected in the California years. There's many, many different types of isotopes detected in huge quantities. The xenon-133 was detected in um, 450,000 times Detection levels, these are huge numbers and persisted for extended periods of time. The model on your bottom is 26 days after the tsunami. The whole planet is covered in radioactive fallout. All the models from all the major government agencies and major institutions and major shakers and movers Quantify those assertions. Television commercials promoting scallops and other fishery products from Japan will be aired on U.S. news channels, CNN. <laughs> anybody here to actually trust CNN? Is there anybody that really? They get the, they got lower viewers than I do. I think that, that's pretty bad, man. I literally got just a. A few handful of viewers, allegedly, according to YouTube. D d according to the nuclear lobby, you said YouTube. Very high con concentrations of hot particles in the Pacific Northwest included plutonium and americium. As China blanketed the import ban, this is Rahm Emanuel and the advertisement we're going to be doing in American TV to promote. So they get you to eat that stuff and then you eat the other stuff, like from the 14 prefectures that were banned by 55 countries for 10 years stuff. The radiation never goes away, so please don't do that to yourself. As Japan's blanket import ban on fishery products from Japan remains in place, and the, or, over the releases of tritium contaminated water, over the releases of tritium. Does it look like any tritium got into these buildings that don't exist anymore? You should be humiliated that they're actually out there saying stuff like that and promoting those narratives worldwide and all your media is promoting it. And to suggest the buildings are crippled, these buildings, if you're, you're on vacation, your employee said, uh, well, hey, Bosch, you know, your 19-story, 190-foot-tall apartment buildings are crippled. And you'd be like, well, send me a couple of pictures, and this is the pictures they send you. You're going to say, get a coat of paint, or you're going to say, my God, man, that's not crippled. That's gone. What happened, right? And because we've been covering it nonstop, unless I'm on the ocean doing research expeditions, uh, we're pretty sick of those words, right? We'll be aired in hopes of encouraged consumption in the United States. So it looks like this is a coordinated effort between South Korea, Taiwan, China, Japan, and America the nuclear industry, and is all coordinated by the International Atomic Energy Agency. Rafael Grossi, he just shakes hands. It's the people behind him that are doing all that work, right? The Secretary General has come and go, but uh, the scumbags in the background are there forever. So they picked up 30 million one-ton bags of radiation. So Rami Manuel claiming that there's no at, there's nothing to worry about is completely he should sue him in court, take him to court and sue him for what he's doing, right? He's he's dishonest. I can't sue him, I'm a Canadian. Can't sue anybody in Canada. Canada was captured by the nuclear industry a long, long time ago, long time ago, long time, long time. 
Chickity China, the Chinese chicken you have. Have a drumstick, your brain start clicking. There's calm down Charlie too when you need someone to pick on. So reactor four to your left, if that was your building, it used to be 190 used to be this building here, 190 foot tall. And someone sent you that picture, would you say, oh shit, or would you say, what's the problem? It's only crippled. So, like, what you're looking at is reactor four, the entire inventory was lost, which is hundreds of times Chernobyl, because it's pure uranium, pure plutonium, and 40 years of inventory. Chernobyl was a graphite reactor, it wasn't pure uranium, pure plutonium, and Chernobyl didn't have massive fuel pool stuff for reactor cores at the top of the buildings. Those fuel pools are stuff because you don't have a repository in anywhere in the world, let alone Japan, see? An affiliate of the Japan, affiliate of the Japan External Trade Organization, established in 2017, to aid the exports of agricultural, forestry, fishery products, and other food items from Japan, from the nuclear wasteland. Because that's what it's all about. They're, they want to export the food from the nuclear wasteland. Bear with me. So the food they're trying to export is from these 14 prefectures that were banned by 55 countries for a decade. <coughs> uh, this was the Medusa, reactor three, the mixed oxide fuel facility. So Rami Manuel pretending that he's he's and everything is good and he quantifies it by getting a picture of him eating something. That somehow mitigates the fact that all these reactors have melted down and that the food was banned by fifty five countries and fourteen prefectures for over a decade. That doesn't work that way, but that's what they're doing. The media and CNN and the rest of them are going to run with that version of it, right? I mean, they picked up 30 million one-ton bags. What, you know, what part about that doesn't worry you? In many cases, Japan's scallops produced mainly in Hokkaido. So you look it up and you see Hokkaido is far, far away from Fukushima. It was sent to re processing facilities in China before they ship in the United States. How interesting is that? Uh, this is the detonation of reactor one. I showed you earlier, I'll just show you again to remind you. So the amount that they're talking about is $845 million a year. Is 91 uh, billion yen is the export. It's quite a lot, it's a significant amount. And so what they're doing is they're manipulating not manipulating, but they're putting out this narrative that, you know, uh, look at Hakido, which is so far away from Fukushima, is not funny, instead of looking at Fukushima. And it's just standard uh, brainwashing from the scumbag public relations for medias. Demand for the Chinese market evaporated when China introduced a blanket ban on Japanese fishery products, including scallops, in August of that year. But the meltdown happened in 2011. The food was banned by 55 countries from the farms and the ocean. So they want you to forget about that, think about only the oceans and think about only scallops. And think about, don't think about Fukushima, think about way up there at the very top of the screen where you can barely see a name up there. That's Hokkaido Island. Very far away, right? Ninety-one billion. Demand from the Chinese market evaporated when China introduced a ban, and that that that's coordinated, obviously, right? Because if you're going to ban, you know, China knows China's not stupid. They know the reactors melted down. China doesn't live in an illusion. China knows the radioactive fallout. China's not naive, they're not gullible. 
But they're not. Uh, it doesn't matter which which administration is in positions of authority. They're well aware of the stuff I'm showing you. Okay. They're just counting that you're not aware. That's what they're hoping for. Demand from the Chinese market evaporated. Japan should evaporate. If anybody wants to test out nuclear, they should test it out on freaking Japan for what they've done to humanity. I despise them. Rami Manuel, Israeli Manuel. Somehow that mitigates the detonations, nuclear meltdowns, and, and the bans from farms, the, the 30 million one-ton bags. None of this stuff goes away. Just another scumbag cutting your throat. That's what we're talking about, right? Just another scumbag cutting your throat. Ocean Minister, this is South Korea, I believe. Ocean Minister, wary of growing reliance on foreign sailors. Well, there's more to it than that. Because they can't, the locals in South Korea don't want to work on the merchant ships, the merchant marines. So the Ministry of Oceans Fisheries had unintentionally drawn huge public attention throughout this year as was tasked with promoting the safety of domestic seafood after Japan began to release the treat of water. So we're talking about South Korea, by the way, you know, South Korea, hot spots at a thousand times normal background, 1,200 kilometers from Fukushima, in Seoul, the capital. But the current administration is pretending nothing happened. Uh, one of the ministry's biggest achievements so far was successful prevention of a decrease in seafood consumption. Because they got the population believing that nothing got out. They sent, like I covered it last night, they sent back six million pounds in 2013. However, the treated wastewater from Fukushima was not the ministry's only concern. Again, like when they talk about treated wastewater, if you're honest, then it's hard to comprehend what they're talking about. Right? It's it's hard to comprehend. Here we go. Hang on. What they're doing, they're talking about treated wastewater, but all the inventories were gone by day six. So they're pretending that the only thing that got out is in the tanks, there's only 2.2 grams, and that's so Korea's professor of nuclear and quantum engineering on July the 13, 2023 this year, they claim that it's equal to three grams of sugar being dumped into the ocean. So they're working together, right? And we cover this as often as we can. It's kind of a bad year for me, but we've been at this from the very beginning. I've been sick a lot this year, that's all. But as soon as I get out of the hospital and back home, I'm doing a show that night or the next night, right? So we don't lose too much time. Protests continue despite long odds. Protests continue despite... So this is a story about protesters. When I interviewed Japanese citizens at rallies protesting against the release of the nuclear-contaminated water from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant into the sea... I asked them a question, considering that there is no sign of a halt to the ocean discharge, why do you still participate in the protests? Well, we're doing a protest by running an educational program, right? He said, to be honest, I don't see any possibility of a halt to the dumping of the radioactive water. Well, it's been going on nonstop. They can't contain it. These are actually meltdowns. You can't contain the meltdowns. Eh? You can't contain this stuff. It can't be contained. He said, we're all saying stop and stop it, but I think, and these are people created uh, artificially on purpose in China, Taiwan, South Korea, in particular, and Japan, to protest tritium instead of protesting nuclear meltdowns and the uranium, plutonium, and a thousand other fission products. It's a total hoodwinking 
And so what they're trying to do is they're going after the Asian population to manipulate the Asian population. And the West has already manipulated you, right? I showed you that earlier. <clears throat> Just bear with me. I get set up here again. All right. Looks good. I was hoping to find that picture. I put uh, Jimmy together of the scumbags pretending they're in Fukushima, but uh, we can't win them all. So remember, you go read that story there, Fukushima contaminated soil 2019. There was 105,000 sites of one-ton bags, 105,000 sites of one-ton one ton bags. It's like it's kind of complicated story, but it's not if you're open-minded and you're honest, and you watch these presentation like this, and you'll you'll get a really good handle on it. You might have to watch some of this stuff a few times to for it to sink in. It is essential to share the issue through casual conversations with neighbors and people to tell the protesters protest in tritium instead of protesting the nuclear meltdowns and the inventories lost from that. Mysterious fish die off in Japan sparks concerns and speculations. So this story has been going strong for six days, I think, or something. It was uh, 2.2 million pounds of anchovies and I believe mackerel or herring or something else, but mostly anchovies. And a keto, an estimated 1,200 tons, which is 2.2 million pounds, formed a silver blanket over a kilometer long near the fishing port of uh, Hakate. Now, this is open ocean we're talking about, so you can't invoke uh, hypoxia, lack of oxygen, into that equation because it's open ocean, right? Unless the ocean is dead. <laughs> Guess what? The open ocean might be dead. Similarity, uh, Nakiri, located first, so witnessed 30 to 40 tons of Japanese scaled sardines or sapa stranded a few days ago, right? And the, the phenomenon's cause remain elusive. Some experts suggest the migratory fish were chased to exhaustion by predators like amberjacks. No, no, that's, that's how that works, right? So you have these huge masses of migratory species, and they follow the anchovies or the squid or the sardines or the krill, and these are like huge 100 miles uh, blocks of them, right? And they're under attack all the time, the, the halibut and the, the tunas, the swordfish, the sea lions, whatever, whales. They're, they're, they, they get underneath and they come up and feed on it. The birds are above it and anything that's accessible, the birds will come in and grab it. And, and they do that for thousands and thousands of miles. That's, just, that's the normal cycle. So to suggest that they were driven up, and there's no evidence, they don't have any evidence for that, by the way. Others point to sudden temperature drops shocking the fish. Now, who are these others? And But the experts don't have a clue who's doing it. So they just, um, they just throw in the big turds in the punch bowl, and hopefully that confuses you and it lulls you into complacency and you don't question anything, right? The speculation arises despite the International Atomic Energy Agency which are the ones that are claiming the International Atomic Energy Agency are the ones that are behind the tritium fable, claiming only 2.2 grams got out of the buildings that no longer exist. That is the United Nations that, and one of their subsidies. Well, multiple. It was the International Atomic Energy Agency, IRPA, UNSCLEAR, and the, I, and the IR, uh, IRPC, or IPRC. The International Protection and Radiation Control, right? So, but they're all United Nations subsidies. So, they all back each other up and like, well, you know, 
Irpa said that uh, we were right. They looked at it, and Onsclear said we were right. This is United Nations uh, IAEA, and even the IPRC said we we're right. So, but you're talking about the the same organization subsidies as evidence. You can't do that. And who's the biggest, uh, the third biggest donator, by the way, to the International Atomic Energy Agency? Oh, that's right, Japan is. Worldwide, Japan is the third biggest donator to the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is claiming that only 2.2 grams got out of four melted reactors and eight melted fuel pools. I don't know why the world sits in silence outside of... It's insane to suggest uh, <laughs> that fish died of COVID. <laughs> Something's in the water. Uh, hi, everybody. <laughs> Saki Brewers. What else we got there tonight? Starfish in the uranium mines, Richard. That's hilarious. Something's in the water. We're all Japanese now. We're all nuclear guinea pigs now. Yeah. Hi, everybody. It's hard for me to, like, I glance over at the comments once in a while, or not. Tonight I'm happy to do it a few times. Hi, Stephen Young, and he's lovely, of course. Hi, everybody. Let's keep going here. Let's keep rolling. We got a poll. Did I bring up the poll tonight for anybody? Should dirty nuclear power plants, also known as disease factories, be treated as enemies of humanity and uh, 8 million species? Well, hell yeah. We got 21 votes. Let's keep her rolling. Saki Brewery flowers again in Fukushima in a nuclear wasteland. An area devastated by the earthquake and tsunami. Don't forget the nuclear meltdown. Now... One sake brewer in Fukushima Prefecture is trying to encourage residents by creating features. Oh, we got James Lucid in your comment section calling in. Hi, James. Chinese chicken. Mr. Dana. Mashita Mashada. Tokyo Bell. Mashita Mashada. Now, I, I, just, I want to be real quick. I just. I, I told you the story before, but what you were just talking about, it's really hammered in. You know, this experience I had with that crab back in 2012, and I can't get that out of my mind. I just can't get it. It, it was, it, let me just like bring back that day real quick. Like, you know, I'm out on the coast of San Diego on this rock outcropping. I'm just by myself, and I knew about Fukushima, and I'm looking at the ocean, and I'm just wondering about the effects going down the road from then. Yep. And literally, like, right after I finished that thought, there was this crab, and it, this little crab, and it was walking up to me with, a, with its claw up. And I'm, like, wondering, like, what the hell is this all about? Like, I don't know what's going on, right? Like, yeah. I've never had sure. a crab walk up to me with confidence that I'm not going to kill it or something, you know? Yeah, no kidding. And and so it gets it gets up to me about, it stops about three feet from where I was standing. And at the moment it stopped, I swear, I'm not making this up. I had this telepathic thought that went through my head the crab told me i'm gonna die please don't forget about me and then after that ended it turned around and walked away and i don't know where it went but every time you talk dana i'm reminded about that crab i swear it's like a, it's like some kind of crazy torture it's not torture or anything but it's just such a reminder uh, i of what's i really going i on. actually and i really believe I had same experiences on, on some places because, you know, like, I was on these beaches. There's nothing there, and I'm out there for months at a time, and I come across a random species or a bird maybe in a tree, 
And it was so so unusual to see it. And I would feel guilt, all this guilt. And it would bother me for days yeah. and days, yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead, James. No, no, I I just don't want you to think I'm crazy. Like, this is really, <laughs> this really happened. Yeah, no worries. And, and I'm, I'm just, it's got to be, there's got to be something to it. Like, we, the, the, you know, everyone yeah. that watches your show, that we feel a connection to yeah. nature, we understand there's an imbalance. We know that Fukushima screwed everything up and, like, no one's recognizing this. We don't know what to do. And then on top of that, you know, some of us, like myself, we've had these connections with these animals before, you know, I even watched you, you know, it's yeah. like they know. Yeah. You know, it's just really weird. And so anyway, that's all I wanted to talk about. I just wanted to, I just felt like I had to get that No, it's just there because something that bothers you, right? And yeah, Like yeah. It, it lingers, you know, and when I'm going through my pictures, I'll have these same moments where it bothers me, right? And then you'll see maybe that'll reflect in the next couple of shows I do where I'll, I'll talk about the ocean a lot because I feel this guilt of not trying to cover it all the time, right? Right. And, um, but, you know, I'm trying to keep the story alive. And so I, I, a number of years back, I started introducing the 24-hour news cycle just to keep the story pertinent and then bring Fukushima into the equation, which worked out really well over the last number of years, I'll admit. And... Um, I, I have these pains of conscience the same way. I, I do believe, like, and, you know, you, you're just your unbelievable supporter. And so, you, obviously, you have the same kind of, um, you know, the same kind of emotional drain that I well, have, too, right? There's got to be millions of people like me out there, Dan. That's what doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yes, heartbreaking. Um, it, the world's not having a conversation. Make, I'm not, it doesn't make any sense. We just gotta, you just gotta keep doing what you're doing, Dan. It's gonna, it's gotta happen. And I'm here behind you. You know, I just. But anyway, that's all I wanted to call about. And yeah, of course, stuff. I'm always. I'm glad you did. It's good. No to, it's good to break up the, the show a little bit for me sometimes too, and it helps other people that are new around here. And all of a sudden, there's another voice. Uh, I'm not like this lone <laughs> nut out in the world. <laughs> Despite the evidence I show, it does, it does make a difference. 100%? Well, you know, whatever it takes, so calm down, Charlie takes a step <laughs> back and realizes, no, come on. Yeah. All right, Dan, let me okay, let my you friend. go. Thank you so much. You're welcome, All right, James. Love you. Love, All right. you, love you too, buddy. Thank you. Good stuff. That's James Luce. You know James in the comments section. And uh, James has been around a very long time. And uh, a lot of the people that are here, there's not very many, <laughs> but... A lot of the not very many that are here have been around a very long time or not are not naive or not gullible in any sense, shape and form. But it draws you know, James' story is a real interesting point because it's an epiphany. You have this epiphany and it haunts you until you find out that that epiphany is real and then it then it really haunts you. And uh, the first expeditions that I done after Fukushima, I was stunned. Because I was an ex-commercial diver and had worked, dove that coastline for 100-day trips at a time, six hours a day on the ocean floor. And when I went out on the ocean and I couldn't find anything in uh, British Columbia, I was horrified. And so we launched extensive research expeditions for six years, for four to five months a year, without coming home, um, sailing the coastline, wrecking on coastlines, and you name it, we... We went to war. Okay, so uh, this plume model, by the way, is a German plume model and is based on six years of emissions. Let me turn that down a little notch because I turned it up so we can make sure James, because I, I can't get the phone to fit perfectly. And I actually ordered the wrong patch cord to plug my phone into the new sound system that I bought a number of months ago because we went high end on the audio a number of months ago and that's been a bit of a a bit of a nightmare trying to figure it make sure I got everything working right and I still haven't ordered the proper plug in it so we can plug the phone in my apologies to everybody for that and so the sake brewery um, and so the 
the news cockatoos, when they come out and regurgitate, watch the news, trust the science, milk pieces come out. When you, if you watch these people, you're like, man, that, that is one scary dude. He, he literally probably can't tie his own shoes. Like he's obviously got a great education, but he's dysfunctional, right? So look at what they're showing their NAMI. NAMI. <laughs> NAMI is a 100% nuclear wasteland. And that's where they were getting the flowers to make the yeast. And so that particular sake, depending, I don't know where they're getting their rice to, but if it's... Um, Let me show you, because there's a lot of cheap rice in Japan right now. And 14 prefectures. So just Fukushima Prefecture was producing over a billion pounds of rice a year. And they never stopped growing it in the nuclear wasteland. In fact, they're harvesting it right alongside of one-ton bags of radiation. There's 30 million of them that they admitted to in 2015, 2016 or something. And back then they had 150,000 sites. But the food was actually banned, all the food, from 14 prefectures, not just Fukushima, for a decade. And appropriately so. There was no reason to lift the ban. The biggest mistake in... Now, Canada didn't have any ban after 90 days. So Japan couldn't ship the food from the nuclear wasteland anywhere for the first number of years, only to Canada legally. And so 14 prefectures, you're talking five or six billion pounds of rice, not counting the other product. And so Japan, in the first year, because the air was saturated, uh, the follow across Japan was hideous. And the cancer shot up right through the roof. Uh, they stopped releasing statistics after the first year. Japan National Cancer Center said the number of patients rose by an extra 865,000 after the first year, after Fukushima. So not everybody got health care. Not everybody was diagnosed. And cancer is just one of many, 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 many illnesses and diseases and autoimmune deficiencies and injuries and illnesses that can manifest but, you know, like heart problems, liver, lung, respiratory, pituitary, thyroid, adrenaline. Um, but also, you're starting to notice Alzheimer's and dementia skyrockets, just gone nuts. And the same thing with Down syndrome and autism, just skyrocketing. And mental illness is skyrocketing, which is a really characteristic of radioactive poisoning, right? Brain damage from radio. So is obesity rates doubling in the first year there, but it, now look at it worldwide, it's gone nuts, right? And that's that's a marker of radiation brain damage after a nuclear event. And so the sake, who knows where they're getting the rice to? But they're getting the flowers from Nami. So are they going to go and buy expensive rice far, far away, bring it back to the nuclear wasteland and make the sake? No. Are they going to get the sake rice from the nuclear wasteland, dirt cheap? Yeah. Guess what they're up to? New Japan envoy in China vows to tenaciously address the Fukushima wrong. So New Japan envoy in China. Now remember, Taiwan, South Korea, Taiwan, China, uh, Japan, the International Atomic Energy Agency, are all, and the United States are working hand in hand to hoodwink you and manipulate you to protect the nuclear industry because nuclear industry is is a big uh, money grab for they rob your countries through the nuclear industry and there's 9,000 industries uh, in the nuclear sector and 90% of the money goes to administration and we're talking uh, like the Hanford nuclear waste site, they estimate they need at least another $760 billion to clean that up. $760 billion. So any benefits nuclear might have had was mitigated immediately by the first and many accidents after, right? The ambassador arrived in Beijing earlier in the day, said the two Asian neighbors need to work 
constructively based on science to find common ground despite their differences on the water discharge, their differences, find a common ground. In response to the water release that began in August, China imposed a total ban on the seafood saying the water was nuclear contaminated. Uh, I just got five or six of these pictures, uh, maybe ten, of these pictures from the research expedition. And all the arrows are just to give you some context. So Vancouver, British Columbia to Alaska, there's 27,000 islands we're talking about. And so I, I can't cover 27,000 islands. It would take you uh, 71 years to visit each island, one a day. And so I went to the pinch points where the ocean would have to come in and squeeze through to get to the interior. But I also done the interior in bad weather, right? And I spend uh, those three boats, and I spend uh, extended periods, four to five months at a time without coming home. And so the species to your left are exterminated. They're gone. And I went back year after year. They didn't come back. And this is post-Fukushima. So was nuclear worth wiping out all the species? That's a question everybody needs to ask themselves because they're exterminated. And uh, I'm going to list you on each picture, start giving you a breakdown. So there should have been around 80 or 78 species of starfish. Each species comes in multiple colors. There should be all kinds of whelks, and sn which are snails, and mollusks, and mussels. There's all kinds of clams, all kinds of shellfish, the little necks, manilas, the razorbacks, the gooey ducks, the scallops, the oysters, and the list goes on and on of those. There should have been uh, all kinds of coral, all kinds of uh, sponges. There's around 76 species of sponges. Each species comes from multiple colors. There's around 74 species of sea anemones, and each species comes from multiple color, vibrant colors, all wiped out. There was this, this unbelievable, unimaginable diversity, this incredible ecosystem that took millions of years to form was exterminated. They're exposed each day, twice a day, to the radioactive fallout, and the radiation comes and hits the mountain, washes down to the coastlines where the species have no way of sheltering from them. So I went back year after year to see if the species recovered. And the first year, I, I, I tell you right now, in, in all honesty, was probably one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. I, I had, uh, that first year, I kept holding hope, even though I knew it was hopeless. I kept having this hope, this optimism, that I was going to find an oasis like you see there, right? Uh, they were still intact. And I had brought 5,000 bags with me to take samples of this incredible diversity. And the problem was there was no species to take samples. And so my detractors were saying, well, how come Dana isn't bringing back species to get them tested? And he refused to tell people because the species were gone. And look, it, you might, it might look pretty cool, but it's a disaster. Try taking that and going out in the middle of nowhere for months and months at a time by yourself. And sometimes I had little or no support whatsoever. And so there's quite a few years in different parts of the years where I was in the middle of nowhere and I couldn't get food, I couldn't get gas, I couldn't get stuff fixed and I had to raise money. There was very bad, very little internet connections. And so I would reach out to radio shows and uh, get on the radio shows and plead to raise enough money to keep the operation going for another month. I accumulated all the equipment. I was very thoughtful on accumulating the equipment. I understood that if I had the equipment, I can fund the rest of it with my little tiny pension. And little did I know I'll be doing that. But a few other people are helping, obviously, and making, you know, I can only afford the basics. I can afford to fuel up a little bits and blah, blah, blah. But if I don't get funding, then the operation grinds to a stop right away. It's very demoralizing for me. But I, I never, I understand the significance and the urgency, so I never give up. Um, but it's a little bit shocking that the world hasn't responded appropriately. 
temporal variations in environmental radioactivity, radiation exposures, doses, in the restricted areas around the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. That study came out today, I thought. I'm looking for the date there. And you can see the people in the study. I listed their names below because they, it upset me that they wrote this study. And I'll explain that to you coming up. Uh, we're evaluated based on a carborne survey conducted October 21st and November 22nd. So they drove a car and they took uh, ear readings of microceivers. Instead of getting out and digging up soil samples and bringing that back and doing testing, they drove along with a cheap Geiger counter and allegedly the annual external, 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 Effective doses in Futaba town and Okuma, which are north and south of the reactor, they're, they're literally joined onto the reactor site, and they're both abandoned for over 12 years, were estimated to be at levels of a millisievert a year. Yeah, that's a millisievert. It's a thousand microsieverts. Uh, a level of milli millisievert a year. Immediately after the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant accident, the go Japanese government implemented emergency protective measures. That's not true. That's the furthest take from the truth. Such as planning for evacuation, sheltering. Well, you're still going to breathe air. If you shelter, you got to drink the water that's incredibly contaminated, and you got to breathe the air that's incredibly contaminated. If you evacuate, you're going to run right into it. And relocation. Of course, everybody that relocated were denied any kind of help. And ones that did get help got minimum help. It got uh, You get more help on uh, welfare than you would from that. People lost their homes. They couldn't go back to the graveyards. Lost their ancestral properties. Distributing stable iodine to help prevent for In fact, they raised, the, they raised the limits for the iodates for children 75 times higher than the World Health Organization. So to suggest that iodine tablets, which can't help you, by the way, because the iodine will still go into all your other organs. And it's not just iodine. How are you going to displace the uranium, the plutonium, the americium, the neutoniums, the strontiums, etc., etc., and times a thousand? So once it goes into your thyroid glands anyway, and it will, because we're having so much, you're producing radioactive hormones for starters, among many, many other things. And so radioactive hormones for the children and insects and birds and mammals and animals and everything else you're talking devastation on a level most people can't comprehend because of the radioactive hormones. Evaluation 20 kilometers around the Fukushima Daiichi plant began immediately on March 11th. No, it didn't. It was completed a day later. Like, what are you talking about? There's no evidence whatsoever to back up that assertion, period. And areas out 20 to 30 kilometers residents were ordered to remain indoors and advised to evacuate voluntarily. Simply not true. Any of this, they didn't do that for several days. They denied people in many communities to ever, and they're still there in Fukushima City and, uh, and uh, Koreyama. Every house in those two major cities, these are huge cities, a couple of hundred thousand people each, Every building is entitled to be decontaminated. Why would why would you stay in a community like that where everything is radioactive? Because well, disciplined slaves, right? So they started listing numbers. Let's go back to that. Cesiums and iodines. So what are you looking for iodine eleven years later for? Disposition on the land in the area around the nuclear power plant. So, radionuclides have a long half-life, like 134 cesium with a 2.1 year half-life. That's not a long half-life. The plutonium, the curium, the americium, the neptunium, the, strant the strontiums, they're long half-lives. Why would you invoke cesium-134 for it? I mean, you know, they didn't need to go in the communities. There's 30 million one-ton bags they could have took samples out of, right? Why would you do what you don't? If you, 
the only reason they done what they were doing is because they were trying to cover it up, or they were completely incompetent, and I don't think that's true. It maybe it was. I don't know. I don't understand how because it's a nuclear wasteland. How could you not know all the abandoned communities are unsafe? So let me just show you some headlines from across Japan of radiation numbers. Um, give me a minute. There we go. We got that's probably enough. Let me bust out a couple more. There we go. Let's do this. I'll just read you some of these studies that were reported in the media. 230,000 beckles per square meter of cesium in Koto, which is actually in Tokyo. That's six times the size limit set for radiation control zones. Well, it should be 180 counts per minute should have been a radiation control zone pre-Fukushima. Post Fukushima, they raised the numbers by absurd amounts. Government uh, session reveals 400,000 times normal Xenon 133 in Chiba, which is 20 kilometers from Fukushima. Strontium 90 found 245 kilometers from the meltdown in Yokohama City, 150 times background. High levels of Strontium 90, 250 kilometers away. But they can't find anything under study right in around ground zero, really. How interesting is that? 24,000 becquels a kilogram of radioactive cesium in the soil samples. 250 kilometers from the meltdown. 30,000 becquels a square meter in Nagano, 250 kilometers from meltdown. Cesium contaminated stretches to Japan's west coast. Over 30,000 uh, becquels a meter in Nagano. I got some horror numbers from Nagano and Nami and Iwakti and Ibaragi and Mimasoma. Absorbed radiation doses of iodine-132 was 10 times higher than iodine-131. Right, and so we had um, absurd numbers, like uh, 220 million atoms of 129 per liter in Ottawa, Canada, for goodness sakes, sustained. So it would have been similar numbers in many, many other isotopes there. And that's a 15 million year half-life. And it pulses just far enough to destroy chromosomes and DNA and cells every second for millions of years. For 15 million years, actually. Uh, times 10 half-life. So 150 million years. So that wiped out the majority of the insects and the birds that were dependent upon it would have starved to death or would have got, because like, cause their life, they don't live long enough to get cancer, right? But there's many other problems happening because they're producing so much white blood cells, they actually get leukemia. Strontium in 2200 locations in Fukushima. High radiation, 270 kilometers. 300 times more radiation released into the atmosphere from burning radioactive debris than claimed by the government. High levels, 350 kilometers in sewage. Like the sewage, you couldn't get rid of the sewage, and you still can't. You can't get rid of the sediment from the water filtration facilities. You can't get rid of the sewage. You can't get rid of the ashes from the incinerators. You can't get rid of the garbage, because all of it's too radioactive in Tokyo, for instance. So what does that tell you? Um, it tells me you're supposed to abandon Japan, see? So the median amb dose, ambient dose, which is external dose, rates and evacuation orders lifted areas in Futabar Town. Well, just because you lifted evacuation orders in little tiny sections of Futabar Town, by the way, right? Uh, in fact, I got a map there somewhere. Right here. Here we go. So you see the, the color coordinations? The yellow are the areas they're going to lift in 2023. Okay, and I got another map that explains what you're looking at a bit better. Let me put that over. So you got Futabar and Akuma, 
or down by the ocean, Fukushima nuclear plant. And then you got Nami Pihon in it, and Minima Soma Pihon, the lady is up at the top, okay? So when you're looking at that, remember what you're looking at. So they're opening these little sections. The red is a nuclear waste, they call it difficult to return. You call it a nuclear wasteland. So they're opening that spot there this year. You got to drive through a nuclear wasteland. You got to get in a car and run into your house. You can't go out in the garden or anything. <laughs> same thing up here and the same thing there. Same thing here last year. But this was just to give you the illusion so they can come out and, and say stuff like this. It's really dishonest what they've done, isn't it? Very, very dishonest to come out with a study like this and all these people. they got a fortune, and their job is to manipulate the people and trick them and make them complacent and send them back into the nuclear wasteland because these are nuclear wastelands. But by their own words. But the problem is, as I just showed you, the whole country is a nuclear wasteland. And you can pretend it's not, but that's what you're doing. You're pretending, right? U.S. promotion of banned Fukushima food contradicts Biden's cancer initiative. Again, they're, they're talking about tritium instead of talking about the nuclear meltdown, so I don't know what's wrong with people. It's not very hard to learn either. Well, maybe it is. I don't know. I think I like to think I do a pretty good job of articulating it to anybody that's unaware, right? Yeah, James just brought up a great story. I'll go find out because that's hard to comprehend that they pretend to shield the children with bottles of water in Kuriyama City. I happen to know where that story is too, so hang on. <laughs> that's a doozy. But it really does show you the contempt that the nuclear industry is able to exert Hang on here, wait for it. Oh, I went into the, hang on, nope. We'll get it. Always takes a second with this. You don't want to make mistakes, so bear with me. Come on, computer, here we go. Short version, no, long version. This one. There we go. Let me do it. Uh, this is really good because I actually got overwhelming amounts. Here we go. It's the craziest story imaginable, too. No, that's not it. I screwed up, eh? That's the story right there. Here we go. Here we go. We're importing it. So this story, elementary school in Japan is using water bottles to shield the students from radiation. An elementary school in Koryama City, located in Fukushima Prefecture, 34 miles west of Fukushima Daiichi Nuclear Power Plant. So it's 34 miles west of the plant. Is using water bottles to shield the radiation coming from the playground, the courtyard, and other areas outside the school building. The bottles are filled with water. And... Uh, like this here. So the kids were all told to bring uh, water bottles and boxes to school. The bottles are filled with water and placed inside the square boxes, which are stacked around the classroom, inside and outside the classroom. And this picture is interesting because they're using aquariums. Look at the aquariums they got there, stacked up also, and buckets of water. 
And the idea is to shield the students from the gamma shines, the alpha burst, the, the neutron bombardment, the better rays from the gardens, instead of evacuating them out of the community. It just seems surreal that I said that. Is using water bottles to shield the radiation coming from the courtyard and other areas of school buildings. The bottles are filled with water, placed around the school. According to the school, it reduced the radiation levels inside by one third. Just a gallows laugh, right? Right, and this is Koryama City. Have been concerned about the high amount of radioactive materials that have been found around the town in Koryama City. So, it's clear. United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation had produced a study in 2013. So the average disposition density of cesium-137 and their time about Beckwell's per square meter. So the second row, and I'll put it, let me put it on the big screen for you. So this, the first row of numbers over there, the first row is the communities, the districts. The next row is the population of each of the community. And the third row is the Beckwells. And think of those numbers as atoms per square meter because a Beckwell is a pulse of energy from an atom. So in order to have those Beckwells, you've got to have an atom there also, right? Physical atoms. And it used to be uh, 180 Beckwells would be an evacuation zone at a nuclear power plant. Okay, so this number here is Beckwell's per cubic, uh, square meter underground and the population across from it. So Koryama City is 162,000 atomic decays a second per square meter. And every house in Koryama City is entitled to evacuation. So why would you keep them there? And why would you go to the extremes of using water bottles? How can a nuclear industry sit in silence and allow that to happen? How can they hate us that much? Well, school lunches are tested for radiation. Like the, the Geiger counters they're using can't test the food very effectively. And they can only check for gamma at best. And the first time you expose them to a large exposure, you have to send the Geiger counter back to the manufacturer to get it recalibrated. The parents are concerned about the food because they can't figure out where it's coming from and the school won't tell them. And because your uh, Koryami city is outside the evacuation zone, the government has barely conducted any decontamination activities. Right? So all of these towns are outside the evacuation zone. All of these, like Fukushima City, 229,000 Beckles, that's 300 plus thousand people living there. What's the population of Koryama City? 341,000 people. And every house is entitled to be decommissioned, same as Fukushima City. Uh, but you can't decontam decontaminate a nuclear wasteland. It just doesn't work that way. Union says urgent action needed to tackle safety concerns at Sellafield. Se Sellafield. I got to bring up. I never went and got the pictures. Look at the, the cows and sheep down there feeding right by the one of the the, the biggest nuclear emitter in Europe. Just give me a second. I'll find a proper picture. And I thought about that today, and then I got distracted, and I didn't go get the picture. And I apologize. I'll show you the picture I'm talking about. And you'll agree. Oh, yeah. You know, the thing about Sellafield is I have oodles and oodles and oodles. Oh, my God. Sellafield really is a nuclear wasteland. I, I'm looking for a picture of all the farmlands. Just get, I'll find one. The whole site, there we go. The whole site is surrounded by farmlands. And they had a meltdown in 1957. It's still hemorrhaging 8 million liters a day into the Atlantic Ocean. And almost every nuclear power plant has that particular attribute where they're surrounded by farms. 
The union has written to the energy minister of nuclear decommissioning authority and Sellafield's chief executive to demand greater investments to keep the 11,000 employees at the massive nuclear rubbish dump known as Sellafield and Crumbia safe. And I got studies. Let me bring up a couple of studies that seem to run that page because it's always entertaining. Well, we had lots of people here when we started the Sellafield story, and now seven people dropped off. I guess they were from Sellafield, were they? <laughs> That's not nice of them. I mean, I, I, I'm just going to grab a bunch of these random headline studies. It's just just to kind of kind of give you an idea. So, in vivo estimates for the uptake of cesium-137 by cattle grazing on contaminated pastures around the estuaries. Well, what about the animals grazing around the actual nuclear meltdown site? And they got fuel pools there that nobody's looked at for 50 years. Nobody even knows what's in it. The people that did or did. Nuclear safety and regulations. Radioactive releases from the nuclear installation, accidental atmospheric discharges. There's no accidental discharges in Sellafield. Sellafield nuclear pollution of the IRC took decades to achieve. That's the most realistic story. Earlier this month, the Guardian revealed a catalog of concerns. I've done entire presentations on them, like two hours straight. Sources familiar with the risks reported the site said they showed that more than 100 safety problems are a matter of serious regulatory concerns. I think they had something like 14,000 issues or something altogether. A cell field spokesperson said safety is their overriding priority at the nuclear wasteland. A spokesperson for the Department of Energy, Security, and Net Zero. <laughs> that cracks me up. Which is a, a net zero is a paper by Miles Allen, right? It was jacked by United Nations and weaponized against the population of Earth. New facility received first nuclear waste shipment. This is Sellafield's story. They're quite proud of this story, by the way, so maybe that's what showed extra people that showed up on the stream tonight. It was those people. The facility can store 6,681 waste boxes in its thick walls and accommodate, and this is above ground, by the way, and accommodate up to nine boxes daily, boxes. You don't put nuclear waste in boxes first off, and the time you're storing it for hundreds of years, so it's definitely not boxes. You got a brand new shiny nuclear wasteland to destroy there. Sellafield newly operational box encapsulation plant product store beeps achieved a milestone by receiving its first shipment of nuclear waste. An above ground vault is equipped to store intermediate level waste safely for the next century. Well, we need information. We like where's your proof of this that you can do that for a hundred years? Because the neutron gamma shines, the X-rays, the beta rays will break down no matter what you're going to use to store it in. The capacity for 6,681 encapsulation boxes. They don't tell us what the boxes are. Calling them boxes is, is counterproductive. We're talking about nuclear, not chicken eggs. Sellafield's legacy ponds and silos. Like, you're, you're talking about putting what's in Sellafield's legacy ponds. No one's even looked at them for 50 years. They just keep, they're outdoors and they keep adding water to it so it doesn't melt down, right? The silos, nobody can get inside the silos. This, If this is intermediate level waste, then uh, I'm a shoehorn. Listen, you're, you're talking fuel. You're talking fuel assemblies. That's what's in those uh, facilities. Dirty, rotten buggers. Yeah, trying to get someone in the nuclear industry, to be honest, is you can forget about it. It's never going to happen. 
The recent arrival of initial waste packages at Beeps originated from the Pile Fuel Cladding, cladding Store. It's not a store where you sell shit, you know. Signifies progress in addressing challenges associated with hazardous waste storage at the cellar field site. Uh, but they don't give you any any information on what the encapsulation is. The facility's systematic retrieval process ensures secure handling and storage of the retrieved waste. I'm very, 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 very concerned about what we're talking about here. I'm very concerned about what we don't know. Now, they got a legacy. Like They had studies saying that the cancer clusters around the nuclear disease factory, Sellafield, was caused by the flu. And we're talking about children's cancer clusters. And we actually had scumbags from the nuclear industry run out with studies saying it was caused by the flu. Flu doesn't cause cancer clusters in children, for goodness sakes. But they used that to justify not investigating it. Safe and reliable, top energy scientist backs nuclear energy. Oh, this is uh, another mass murderer. Uh, oh, this is Australia. Australia's got the worst, don't they? Isn't Australia the worst of the worst when it comes... Like, Britain is pretty bad. But uh, Australia is pretty, they're pretty mean and nasty people in the nuclear industry. The former CEO of Australia's nuclear science technology operation, Dr. Adai Patterson, expressed support for nuclear transition, underlining potential benefits in reducing energy prices. Well, nuclear is the most resource intensive energy period, bear nothing. It can live with renewables, calls for nuclear ban to be lifted. That was the same guy, nuclear expert, nuclear scumbags, more like it. Dr. Adai Patterson is calling for the Albanese government to allow nuclear energy to have a partnership with renewables. Like the last thing you need, like if you want a partnership with renewables, is geothermal. Why would you look at nuclear? It's safe and it's reliable. It's not safe, and it was never safe, and it's never be reliable. And this uh, Sky News, man, they are they are so pro-nuclear, they would kill everybody in Australia just to, to get a check from the nuclear industry, I bet you. China develops containers for fast reactor used fuel. So we're, we're talking about mixed oxide fuel. That takes a long time to cool down. It, 30, 40, 50 years to cool down before you can put it in any kind of container. And these containers are um, these containers are huge containers, 100 tons, is it? Yeah. Uh, which is uh, 200,000 pounds, right? 200,000 pound container. What's, I like to know what Sellafield encapsulation is doing. I'm going to have to look that up for the next, uh, well, for the weekend, I'm going to have to go figure that out. Fast reactors, which are breeder reactors, are planned to become the predominant reactor type in China by mid-century, which no one believes that's true, by the way. Sodium-cooled pool-type fast breeder reactor. So the breeder reactor can make plutonium, plutonium, which is named after the devil, to make fuel for the plutonium reactors. These are mixed oxide fuel reactors which are legal in Canada and the United States. I mean, experimental licenses exist, but generally the consensus is they're illegal. Helen Woodson, plowshare anti-nuclear activist who spent 27 years in jail, dies. She was awesome, man. Uh, she, was, uh, she went into and robbed a bank and then set the money on fire. She used a starter pistol and then... She got $25,000, and she put it on the floor of the bank and set it on fire and called it evil, right? So that's hardly a robber. Oh, she understood the dangers of nuclear. Bless her heart. And she was a... She backed it up with... Uh, she spent 27 years in jail... She was that effective, unfortunately she didn't have a voice, that they locked her away for 27 years altogether. 
She get out. She go back and she attacked the nuclear industry again, and they put her in jail again. And that's the story of the nuclear industry, isn't it? She mailed what she called uh, warning letters with thirty-eight caliber bullets affixed to various government and corporate officials, including the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. It's a good way to get attention. Two corporate CEOs and chairman of federal board, reserve board. She wrote that her letter said that their actions were like bullets fired into the hearts of creation. And for this, she was convicted of threatening communications and being a felon in possession of ammunition. Dirty, despicable, disgusting, maniacal, sadistic prosecutors to charge her. Sadistic scum to do that to her. The Nuclear Register, a quarterly publication that serves as a clearinghouse for information about contemporary non-violent resistance to war and a nuclear threat. Did anybody put, uh, did you ever see my name at the Nuclear Register? I couldn't find it over there. Three days after her release, she walked into the Chicago bank, produced a starter pistol, and asked for her to tell her to empty all the cash drawers. After receiving 25,000 cash, she pulled it in the middle of the floor, doused it with lighter fluid, and set it on fire. And the money's insured. She wasn't trying to rob them. But the nuclear industry, right, that took that opportunity and locked her away. And bless her heart for doing what she done. We admire her and we love her for her tenacity and for her diligence. And for her sacrifices, we are absolutely thrilled that people like her existed. And we're sorry they done that to her. Video message from Prime Minister Kishida at the ev launch event of the Youth Leader Fund for a World Without Nuclear Weapons. So Kishida, of course, is he's falling... Uh, Everybody hates him in Japan, right? So he's trying to piggyback some street creds by associating himself with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He's from Hiroshima, isn't he? Radiological protection. This is the Nuclear Energy Agency. You know what kind of degenerate they actually are. Radiological protection for small modular reactors in focus at the 33rd ISOE Management Board meeting. Well, there's the jet degenerates and all their glories. These are all exceptional scumbags, eh? These are all mass murderers that hate humanity. The Management Board of the Information System and Occupational Exposure is administered jointly by the Nuclear Energy Agency and International Atomic Energy Agency. Oh, really? held his 33rd meeting in Vienna on the 4th and 7th of December. Scum. ISOE Management Board is composed of leading experts representing 77 nuclear licensees, nuclear plants, and 27 regulatory authorities from 31 countries participated in this joint undertaking. Joint undertaking is right. International Atomic Energy Agency activities in small modular reactor safety. So the International Atomic Energy Agency is the very, very, very last people you want to be trusting. They're claiming nothing got out of these buildings, only 2.2 grams of tritium. There should be thousands of people protesting their existence. There should be thousands of lawsuits against them worldwide. Nuclear power station could be decommissioned with the help of autonomous robots. Uh-huh, yeah. Really? What, that? You're going to dismantle these massive sites. And almost a billion pounds of radioactive material from these sites, are you? First off, the electronics are going to fry. You go near any kind of radiation. Second off, if any of these goes near a hot zone, you can't get near them again. It's complete fantasy. Could be decommissioned in the future by a, a team of an autonomous robots known as Smurfs, scientists have suggested. 
first, like, why would you believe anything a scientist tells you anymore after looking at Fukushima? Scientist says nothing got out of that. I don't see them after saying, hey, you know, Fukushima lied to you. We're here to help you, but Fukushima lied to you. Right? Nuclear power stocks hit highs on anticipated surge in demand. For goodness sakes, don't buy shares in nuclear. I'll show you what. Let me go back. Let me show you why you want. This is really, really simple science. We, we've had serious wind the last couple of days here, and today is like madness out there. La -di -da -da -da. And here we go. In the next two years, 90 reactors are expected to go offline. You're, you're being sucked into an endless void. Global nuclear power faces unprecedented challenge. So there's 407 reactors, not 440 like they were claiming. And it's 365 gigawatts worldwide, the entire planet. So this year for renewable energy is 440 gigawatts, which is a lot more than the nuclear, 365 gigawatts. And the renewables is just one single year. Right? Last year was 390 gigawatts, and the year before that was 330 gigawatts. So, look, to produce more energy in one year than nuclear has in 70 years, why would you invest in nuclear? And this story that came out a few days ago, saying the world will have to rely on emerging generation small modular reactors, well, it's better to build geothermal. And they actually showed you the mixed oxide fuel meltdown. And they call it white smoke. This is not white smoke, you despicable lion scum. It's a lethal dose immediately for anybody gets close to it let alone breeze that so a further nuclear reactors in advanced economics average 35 years of age and face widespread shutdown with a quarter of the existing capacity projected to be offline by 2025 in two years time due to aging infrastructure so why would you buy stocks when 90 of the reactors are going to be down in two years and when renewables are smashing every year, doubling almost, and have now surged. Now, if you put geothermal in, and there's a couple of really easy storage solutions for wind and solar that they refuse to fund, problem solved. Don't, don't put money in nuclear shears, for God's sakes. It's a total scam. They're going to steal your money and pay the last investors, and they'll siphon off a chunk for themselves. And that's called a Ponzi scheme. And it's illegal what they're doing. And we've been covering it for 12 years, this scam with the nuclear stocks. Nuclear power stocks hit high on anticipated surge in demand. The surge in demand can't be fulfilled. It's a Ponzi scam. It'll take you 14 or 15 years before they can get a reactor up, and there's only a few places that can build them. South Korea is not one of them. And France is not one of them either. Britain can't build their own. They got France doing it. China can't even build most of their own. They got somebody else doing it. And uh, You're going backwards. Why do that? You can get major returns on geothermal for goodness sakes. The influx of investors' money into the nuclear power has lifted stocks. And this is totally artificially, right? And so Sprout Physical Trust bought up the physical uranium a couple, two years ago, two and a half years ago, and at $30 a pound or something of yellow cake, and just they wouldn't sell it. And so that artificially caused the demand. And so the stock shot up like the 50 bucks. They still didn't sell it. And so now they raised enough money to buy a whole bunch of more. And now the mining companies had to go back to work because they didn't have any inventories. 
And so for the last two years, they've been doing this trick every couple of months. The, the, the stocks will, because the, the purveyors, the people that are pushing the stocks, are pushing these uranium stocks. And then people lose their money. they got to wait for a couple of weeks for everybody to calm down. And then they pull the same scan over and over and over. For goodness sakes, don't invest money in these degenerate, despicable, disgusting, sadistic monsters. Yep, no human value. That's right, Port Angeles. Thank you. So the recent constipated party 28 climate talks included a pledge to triple nuclear power. You can pledge it all you want. You don't have the manpower. You don't have the supply networks. You don't have the inventories. You don't have the equipment. You don't have, you, like, it takes them 10 years just to, to, to create a site to put the nuclear facilities. There's two or three or four years of impact studies. they got to study the geological stability of the area. There's endless the resources for water. I mean, if you go look at the plants we're trying to build in the United Kingdom, you'll appreciate everything I'm saying is 100% true. Listen, uh, there's no incentive for me to lie to you, okay? I can't educate the population by lying to you. You know, I can do a radio show but I can't educate you by doing a radio show. And so the way I do it is the most resource-intensive way, the, the hardest way to teach is I provide you all the documentation. And I remember all these years back when I decided I was going to undertake that. I was like, the best thing I could do is create an educational program, provide the documentation, but I ran a lot of problems, right? Was, you know, all, all this video formats and all the picture formats and all the other stuff... A lot of systems can't handle a lot of that. They'll freeze up on you. And so the equipment I bought is the same equipment from the TV stations. I bought it from the same suppliers. And I bought the cheap versions, obviously, right? And it's, it's taken me a very long time to build up this whole operation. It's a very fragile time. And we finally got it built. And, and it works really good. I'm able to easily import and tell the stories and uh when i'm when i'm good i'm doing five stories a week right five shows a week and we cover the news cycle to make it pertinent that's a 24-hour news cycle so all those headlines you know there's a lot of people that are searching that stuff we're trying to bring them in and educate them on how evil this uh, hateful industry this disgusting sadistic traders industry actually is <clears throat> okay well I guess that's it for us tonight how do we do here we're 155 are we well wow. do I stall for another five minutes or do I just call it night I think we'll just call it a night that's a lot of work today to make it again tonight there's three shows this week I'm feeling it too. <laughs> we'll be back tomorrow night, though. Don't worry about Dana. Get some rest. Get some exercise and get back at it tomorrow morning when I wake up. Um, see everybody tomorrow night. So, see, James sent to PayPal again. Thank you, James. My goodness. You're a lifesaver, my friend. Um, so let's end it right there. Hugs for everybody. We're going to finish the poll out. Hi, everybody. Let me bring up the poll. We'll call it a night here in a second. Should dirty nuclear disease factories be treated as the enemies of humanity and the 8 million species? Absolutely. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up over here on the likes. And I appreciate everybody that participated in the poll. That means a lot to me. And if you go back and look at all my polls and took a screen capture of them all and printed it out into a book, the world will be a better place. Good night, everybody. Hugs for everybody. And I, and I do come in and read all your comments later or I read them the next morning. And... Uh, 
It's just like I'm overwhelmed with the amount of work I do each show and I don't want to drag the whole night out if it's unnecessary, right? And thank you again, James, my friend. And I really do appreciate the phone calls. You really do. It breaks up the show. And it's good for people to hear another narrative, right? That human experience goes a long, long way. Good night, everybody. Take care. We'll see everybody on the other side tomorrow night, same time. God bless everybody. Take care.